Good afternoon to our respected speaker, Professor Shugoto Shen Roy, our respected principal, Dr. Modhumita Manna, our convener of organizing committee, Mr. Arup Kumar Haith, teachers, students, and all other participants. Bidanagar College Statistics Department welcomes you to this one day state level webinar. We request you all to keep your audio and video turned off during the webinar. Participants' queries or questions in the chat box or the comment box of the Google Meet or YouTube, respectively, during the talk by our eminent speaker. The link for filling up the feedback form will be provided in the chat box or comment box of Google Meet and YouTube, respectively, at regular intervals. Registered participants will get their e-certificates only after filling up the form. Now I would request our principal, uh, Dr. Modhumita Manna Ma'am, to please deliver the welcome speech. Thank you, Arnob. A very good afternoon to our esteemed speaker, the distinguished guest, the faculty members, the participants, and my dear students. Today, Department of Statistics, Vidhanagar College has organized a state level webinar on how much does a kilogram of flour weigh to be delivered by Professor Shugato Shen Roy, Professor and Head, Department of Statistics, University of Calcutta. Statistics is in our daily life. It help, help, helps us to select the proper methods of collecting data, analyzing the data, and presentation of the results effectively. Statistics helps scientists to predict anything. Today, I am extremely delighted to have among us eminent statistician, Professor Sen Roy, as, a, as our speaker. His topic, how much does a kilogram of flour weigh, sounds interesting and popular. I am grateful to him for accepting our invitation and giving us his valued time from his busy schedule to share his knowledge and experiences with all the participants and to educate the young minds of our students. On behalf of Bidhanagur College, I cordially welcome you, sir. I heartily welcome all the participants from different universities and colleges. I am uh, thankful to Mr. Arup Kumar Hai, convener of the webinar and head of the Department of Statistics, Vidhanagar College, and all the members of the organizing committee and the faculty members of the department for organizing webinar on such an interesting topic. I'm happy to inform you that we have about 350 participants sharing Google Meet and YouTube live streaming platform. They are from various universities, namely Delhi University, University of Hyderabad, Indian Statistical Institute, Jadapur University, University of Calcutta, Presence University, Badwan University, University of Kollani, St. Javier's College, Ashutosh College, Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandira, Native Raven College, Barashat Government College, Scottish Church College, Srinandranath College, Acharya Prafulla Chandra College, Taki Government College, etc. I, I hope in this bleak time of COVID-19 lockdown, the seminar will bring us some freedom of mind. My best wishes to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Ma'am, for your welcome speech. Now I would request our convener of organizing committee and our head of the Department of Statistics, Mr. Arup Kumar Haid, to introduce our okay. speaker. Sir, please. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. And welcome to today's webinar on how much does a kilogram of per way. First of all, once again, I request everyone, except today's speaker, to mute your device to avoid background noises that may distract you from listening to the webinar. 
you can enter your question and comments in the chat box throughout the presentation your active participation is important throughout the session i would now like to introduce today's speaker professor sugato sen roy it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our eminent speaker professor sugato sen roy professor sen roy completed his undergraduate studies from astral presidency to 1988 complete completed his masters in the year 1983 from university of calcutta and phd from the university of calcutta and then he joined in the calcutta university as a lecturer in the year 1989 and subsequently promoted to full professor in the year 2007 he is currently the head of the department of statistics university of calcutta he was also associated with the astral physics college in indian statistical institute university of nebraska in usa department of economics calcutta university monash university in austria as a visiting or guest faculty in different points of time he was also invited to speak in various international workshops or seminars or conferences organized by reputed institutions in india and abroad he worked in various fields of statistics this includes time series analysis regression analysis econometrics survival analysis development statistics and functional data analysis under his guidance student four students have got a phd and three are at present pursuing phd under his guidance he has completed 10 research projects funded by either ugc or icmr or dst or ncert or cdm currently he is busy in the ugc mox project for development of e content for pg courses in statistics apart from his teaching he is also a prestigious author of a number of research articles published in reputed journals some of his better known titles include a popular based approach for estimating the survival functions of two alternate recurring events which is published in the journal of statistical computation and simulation another one estimating the hazard functions of two alternating recurrent events in the presence of covariates which is published in the journal of advances in statistical analysis there are so many articles but I just mention only two due to lack of time so i am grateful for his presence among us today May I now request Professor Sugato Sen Roy to deliver his speech. Hope all of you will enjoy the lecture. Over to Professor Sugato Sen Roy. Thank you, Arup, and uh, thanks to the principal of Bidanagar College and the faculty of Bidanagar College for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak to young minds, and uh, that's the reason I selected a topic like this. So I've been discussing with Arup regarding the topic, and I thought that this, since the third and fifth semester students will be here, probably this would be a suitable topic for you, so that the third semester students can also understand what statistics is all about. Okay. So there would be some parts of it, and I'll mention which parts, which probably would be beyond the third semester, but uh, that's meant for the fifth semester student. But I'll explain those also. But the majority of this talk would be primarily for third semester students as well as for the fifth semester. So it will not be very difficult for you to understand. So what my intention was to deal with the topic where you see that in everyday life we, how you can use statistics. It's something very simple, but uh, this problem, the one I have talked about, but uh, there are a lot of statistical problems associated with this, as you'll see. Okay. So uh, let me share the screen with you. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so this is my topic. How much does a kilogram of flour weigh? It's very obvious it weighs a one kilogram, right? But uh, there is something, there is a catch about this. Okay, first of all, let's look at how does it look like. So this is one packet of flour, okay? And uh, this is the front side on the left-hand side, and on the right, you have the back side of it. And it's written there, its net weight is one kg. So this packet is a one kg packet of flour. Okay? Now, what is so new about this? Okay, everybody buys this every day almost. Okay, so we go to the shop, buy this, and there is no problem as, far, as such. Okay, but then how do you make these packets? So it's in the mills that you go, and in the mills they make flour, and then they package it. Okay, packages of one kilo. Now, when you make the package, where is the problem? The problem is no packaging unit can make packets containing exactly one kilogram or 1,000 grams. You can understand this, right? If you try and fill a glass of water with just one liter, not one drop more or one drop less, can you do that? It's almost impossible to do that. So what would happen? Some of the packets will have more and some will have less. So it's not exactly 1,000 grams that every packet will have, up to the minutest grains. That is not possible. You can understand that. Okay. So what does it mean by 1 kilogram or 1,000 grams of flour? So that is the problem. Now, what happens if you have some more, some less? How would the consumer and the producer react, the buyer and the seller? Okay, what would be their viewpoint? You can look, if you, you, we are generally the customers, okay, the consumers. We'll be happy if we get a packet having more than one kg for the same price, okay? But definitely we'll be complaining if we have a packet which has less than one kg. Okay, so some of us would be happy because nobody is going to get exactly one kg, very unlikely. So some will get more, some will get less. If you get more, you are happy. If you get less, you are not happy. You will be complaining. What about the producer? The producer would not mind if a few packets are overweight. That's part of the cost. Okay, so... But if too many of them are overweight, obviously the producer would start thinking that, okay, I'll need to do something about this. So this is the scenario. Okay, so on the one side, producer, if you look at the producer, some of them weighs more, some of them weighs less. So it doesn't really matter if you're selling a lot of packets. But for the consumer, this matters. You see, this is where statistics always creates a problem. I'll, maybe I'll digress a little and talk about this. You see, when we talk about statistics, it's a collection of observations and then some summary statistics based on this observation. But each individual observation has its own distinction, okay? In this case, the summary is being looked upon by the producer. He's looking at the mean, maybe. So mean is 1,000, some more, some less, doesn't really matter with him. On the average, he's producing 1,000 grams. For the consumer, he buys only one packet. And if it is less, he is dissatisfied. If it is more, it's fine with it. It's something like, I'll, I'll maybe I'll just digress and give you an example. We talk about expectation of life. OK, so everybody says that at 40 years of age, the expectation of life is 30 years, maybe. So what does it mean? Everybody of age 40 is not going to live up to the age 70. On the average, they're going to live up to the age 70. But somebody, if he believes that he is going to live 70 because he's just 40 now, okay, he might be lucky, he might be living 80 years, or he might be living 45 years only. So individually looking, it doesn't mean anything. It's on the average that you are going to go up to 70 years. Similarly here, so it's, consumer is looking individually at it. The producer is looking at an overall picture and hence would not be too bothered with some overweight or some underweight packets. Now, 
If we move on to what the law will say, so nobody would want to have a package of less than one kg when they are paying for one kg of flour. So what would they do? They would have some laws for this, and different countries would have different laws. Okay, in this talk there will be certain things that I'll be assuming. I'll tell you which I'll be assuming, and there are certain things which are inherently built in this, okay? which I'll not be assuming, which are there always. So different countries have different laws. Mostly what happens is that the producer's problem is given due recognition, but more importantly, more care is taken on the consumer's grievances. You have this consumer sales and things like that, where if you get some good which is not good enough for the money you have paid, you can go and tell them that this is not good, and then they will get hold of the seller, etc., and maybe they will ask the seller to pay a penalty or compensate you, etc. So generally, there are laws which mostly favors the consumers. Okay. So let's look into this a little bit deeper. Okay. So now this is something, uh, as I said, that uh, whenever we talk about statistics, we talk about data, and obviously when I say that one kg of flour, how much does it weigh? Obviously, it's one kg. But if you take 50 packages and weigh them, then you'll find that none of them actually weighs exactly 1,000 grams. OK? Some will be more, some will be less. How do I know that? I collect a sample of packets. OK? Say, in this case, I've collected 50 packets, weighed them, and this is the weights that came out. So you can see some of them are over 1,000, some of them are less than 1,000. So this is the overall data that I have. And whenever you have a data set, the first thing that you do is, OK, you don't like this, maybe. But the best thing that you can always do is to draw some diagrams, try and understand what the data is about. Go into the mathematics at the very onset. Okay? And so what we did was, we drew the histogram for this. And you can see that this histogram looks quite familiar. It, it's a, it is a mode in the middle and then falls off on either side. So mode is around 1,000 and gradually falls off on either side. I'll come to the details of this. So one thing that we look at is the histogram. The other thing is the box plot that we look at. And if you look at the box plot here, you can see that the median, median is almost around 1,000. It's slightly positively skewed because the median is slightly on the lower side of the box. OK, but these are characteristics that you try to look at for the data. But we'll not be too concerned with the data here. We'll use the data somewhat, but we'll not be too concerned with it. We are not going to go for a data analysis type of thing in this talk. Okay. Now, we make a data summary. And the data summary shows us that the minimum weight is 958.8 grams, the maximum weight gives so us the median weight, the mean weight, and the standard deviation. And the mean weight comes out to be 1,000, and the median weight is almost close to it, 999.5 grams. So it's centered around 1,000 grams, and the standard deviation comes out to be 15.46 grams. So uh, I've written it's almost equal to 16 grams. I'll come to this in a moment. I'll be assuming 16 grams, and uh, but not without a question. So maybe I'll just keep it for as it is for the day. So can we assume the ways to have a normal distribution? They have a bell-shaped distribution. The weights are concentrated around 1,000 grams. The mean and the median are almost 1,000. The mean is exactly 1,000. It's closely symmetric. And so possibly, yes, it's, we can assume the normal distribution. So we assume that the weights are normal with mean 1,000 and standard deviation 16. So variance is 16 squared. I have put uh, three question marks on either side of this because, well, I am assuming this. Now you'll tell me that why do you assume this? Firstly, I'll give you answers to two of the questions, not three. There are three things I assumed. One is the mean is 1,000. The other is the variance is 16 squared. And the third is that it's a normal distribution. OK, uh, I'm not in a position to answer the third question. But then it's bell-shaped. 
almost symmetric. So I'm assuming it to be normal. But you can work with other distributions. So what I'll be doing next, you, if you don't assume normal, it is fine. You can do with any other distribution. Okay. As for the mean and the variance, OK, so how do I assume this? Firstly, what you can do is, and this is something the third semester students probably haven't done yet, but you will see that the next two slides are differently colored. This is just for to answer that, can we assume this to be normal, 1016 square? So what do you do if you, if you have a problem like this? The fifth semester students will be able to tell me. So if I assume x is normal mu sigma square, I don't know what mu is, what sigma square is. In that case, if they're unknown, obviously you do have some inference. Okay, so you estimate them. And when you estimate them, so the estimate of mu would come out to be 1000 grams because estimate of mu or mu hat is x bar and your x bar is 1000 grams. So you can take mu hat to be 1000 grams. The estimate of the standard deviation would be 15.46 grams because that's what the standard deviation came out to be. Okay. So if I use the estimates instead of the original mu and sigma square unknown mu and sigma square values, I can as well take 1000 and 15.46. So taking 1000 is plausible, but I'm taking sigma equal to 16 grams and not 15.46 grams. Why? Okay, the simple answer is, well, it's easier to work with, but that's not a good answer, right? So just because it's easier, you can't just go about doing this because my estimate came out to be 15.46. So what else can you do here? I want 16, so I don't want to work with 15.46. So what I did was, I looked at it from a different viewpoint. What I was looking at now was something like this. Can we justify sigma equal to 16? So let's redo the whole problem. So instead of doing an estimation problem, I want to do a hypothesis testing problem. So I'll assume 1,000 because it's 1 kg. So my mean, I'm assuming it to be 1,000. Or is it not 1,000? That's the question. My sigma, I'm assuming to be 16 because I want it to be 16. I don't want to work with a figure like 15.46. So I assume this to be sigma equal to 16 against sigma not equal to 16. And uh, you can see that h dot 1 is accepted because X bar is 1000, mu is 1000, so the T observation, observed T would come out to be zero, and obviously you'll not be rejecting the null hypothesis. So in this case, we can plausibly take mu to be 1000. But that was also the case for estimation, so it's fine with mu. But what about sigma? If you look at sigma, we do a chi square, and then we find that n minus one x, this is the statistic that you use. And this is the observed value, and these are the two cutoff points. And since this falls within the cutoff points, even if the actual value is 15.46, my null hypothesis that sigma is 16 can be accepted. So probably it will not be the estimate, but I can still probably take sigma to be 60. So that's the reason I have taken it to be 1016. These are the justifications that we did, but uh, okay, but we'll be digressing. So these two slides are primarily inference problems and I'll not be talking about inference problems here. So for the fifth semester students, I think this is fine. You understand what's happening. This is how you always make a test and then justify the assumptions that you are making. Okay, so we come back to what we had been talking about. So what do we now have? We have a normal distribution with mean mu equal to 1000 and sigma equal to 16 grams. Okay. Now half the packets are overweight and half of them are underweight. Will the producer complain? Obviously no. And will the consumers complain? Half the time they'll be happy and half the time they will complain because half the time they have an overweight packet 
half the time they have an underweight package and they probably would be complaining half the time. Now, what would be the legal view? Now, in this case, of course, I said different countries have different laws. So I'm assuming this laws. These are not the exact values that the laws are based on. So in this case, I'm assuming, say, that uh, one person, percent margin of underweight is allowed. So if it's one percent less, it's fine because you have to give some leeway to the user. But if it is more than one percent, it's not so good. So up to ten grams less in a packet marked one thousand grams is admissible. But so it's fine if X is not greater than or equal to nine ninety grams. But there will be a fine imposed on you if this is. If, is, if this is less than 990 grams. So what does it mean to the producer? You see, the probability of X less than 990 is going to be, I can, I wrote said as the standard normal. Okay, so if you do these calculations here, it comes out to be phi of this, and that value comes out to be 0.266. So 26.6% times the producer is going to be prosecuted. Because the packets, if you have a normal distribution with mean 1000 and variance 16 square, then 26.6% times the weight of the packet is going to be less than 990 grams. And if it's less than 99, 990 grams, then you are going to be prosecuted. So this is, this is unfair to the producer because at times he is also giving you overweight packets. See? But again, as I said, two customers, one gets overweight packet, he's happy, goes away, doesn't complain. The other one, he gets underweight and he'll be complaining, obviously. He's getting one packet which doesn't contain what he wants, actually. So it's much less than what he wants. So he'd be com complaining. So what? <clears throat> okay, have a look at the profits. So what happens now? So price of a packet of flour um, is around uh, rupees forty-two these days. And if the cost of producing one thousand grams of flour, I'm assuming it to be rupees thirty. It can be a little more or less. So I just assume it to be rupees thirty. Then if you look at one packet of flour, then the profit is rupees 12. And suppose the fine is rupees 50. Okay, so if it is less than 90 grams, the shopkeeper or the seller will have to pay a fine of 50. It's generally more than the price of a packet because it's sort of you give him the packet as well as some fine for this is basically the cost of a legal cost, maybe. So he has to file a complaint, excess. So this harassment will cost something. So maybe it's a little more than what the actual price of the package is. So the price is 42. Suppose the fine is rupees. So I'm assuming all this. Okay. So suppose if this is 50, then the total profit from 100 packets, you make uh, 12 rupees from each packet is 1200. And the expected fine paid would be 15 to 26.6 percent of the packets are going to be underweight. So you take a fine of 1,330, and what happens? The producer just goes out of business. Okay, so he has for every hundred packets, he's going for a loss of 130 rupees, and obviously he can't sustain the business. So he has a problem. Now what happens? So nobody is going to produce and sell packets of flour. Okay? But luckily for the producer, what happens is most of us or many of us do not really notice that we are getting a packet which is underweight. So maybe only 25% of the customers getting underweight packets complain. There are some very fussy customers. They probably would go back home and weigh this. But many of us don't do that. So again, this is fictitious. So 25% of the customers getting underweight packets complain. Okay, I have some blue question marks around this, just because 
I have just said this is a fictitious figure that I have picked up 25%. How do you get this figure? You know, half the packets are going to be underweight, and you can calculate 990 packets. Uh, how many packets are less than 990 gram? You can calculate this. So, out of 100 packets, 26.6% of the person should be coming back. But actually, you can do a survey here also and find out how many do come back. You'll see that not 26, but maybe six or seven of them come back, comes back. So you get an estimate of this. So you can, again, this is 25% can be estimated. So for the timing for this talk, I'm just assuming it to be 25%, but you can always do a survey and find the exact figure of how many customers getting underweight packets are actually complaining. Okay. So this is something, again, you can use a little bit of statistics, sample surveys, etc., and get the figure for. So here is again another problem. But assume 25%. So what happens is that you, the fine paid is not, it's not what we saw before. It's not 1,330. It's much less. It's 332.50. And that is good for the producer because he at least makes some profit. He was supposed to make a profit of 1200. Now he is doing it a little less than 900 because he has to pay the fine of 332. So, but he makes a profit, but it is 75% or less than what he actually could have. So he still incurs some loss or he doesn't get as much money he was expecting to get. So he'd still be thinking as to what to do about this. So what are his options? One option is increase the price to cover the fines. I'll go through this slide very quickly. So because this is this has nothing to do with statistics, it's more of business. So you make the price go up to 45.33. This is a figure I came out with. You can calculate this. So an approximately an 8% increase, and that would actually cover the loss of 300 rupees. So you increase the price. But what happens if you increase the price? you may lose some customers. Okay, some people would go away if the price is too high for them, they'll not be buying. And uh, maybe some other seller is selling at a lower price, so this is a very competitive market generally. So if you increase, you just can't increase the price randomly. Okay? And if you increase the price, the other thing is that the fines will also increase, mind you, fines will cover the cost of the packet as well as some extra cost for filing the case, etc., etc. So the fine will also go, away, go up and you'll have to again make a compromise. So this is something, this is more of a business strategy that you can think of. But this is this doesn't concern us statisticians. So as statisticians, how can we help the producer? We have two ways of doing it. So one is, suppose the producer puts in a little extra in each packet. So what happens now is he shifts the bean to say 1,020 grams, okay? So instead of 1,000 grams, mu is now 1,020, so he's putting 20 grams purposely on in each packet, okay? So what is his chance of prosecution now? Now it's, a, it's again a normal distribution, but with the mean shifted to 1,020 rather than at 1,000. The variance, I'm assuming, is the same. So I still have... X is now less than 990 and your Z is the standard normal. But since you have shifted the mean to the right now, what happens is that the percentage of values less than 990 becomes very small. It's only 3% now. So if you put in 20 grams more, you are getting only 3% underweight packets. I'll come back to this problem. There is a lot of problems here. I'll talk about this in a moment. But uh, let's see how it actually reflects on the profit. So cost of additional 20 grams per packet would be 0 0.60. This is from the 30 rupees for 1,000. And so 20 grams more would be 0 0.60. So for 100 packets, it will be rupees 60. But the expected fine now is for only 3%, not 26. So it's 15 to 3% into 0.25. Again, every one of those 3% are not going to turn up. 
So it's 0 0.25 and your fine comes down to rupees 36.50. So what is your additional expenditure? It's the additional cost of packet. That's 60 rupees plus the expected fine that you're paying now. That is 36.50, which makes it 96.50. And this is much, much lower than those 300 something that we had before. So you can decrease the actual cost or additional cost by simply shifting it to the right. So instead of 332.50, now the producer is losing only rupees 96.50. And the last question is for you to do. Can you make it even less? You can try. How do you do this? You see, this is more of an optimization problem. If you shift the mean from 1000 to the right, I have shifted it to 1020. If I shift it to 1030, then probably there will be nobody having an underweight packet. But then the cost will be going up also because you are putting 30 grams extra in each packet. Okay. So the distribution is shifting to the right. On the other hand, if instead of 1,020, I had put in 1,010, then obviously the cost would have been lower. I would have still shifted it to the right from 1,000 to 1,010, but then the number of packets below 990 would have gone up. So the fine would have been more, the additional cost would have been less. So you see, you have an optimization problem here. And you can try and see which, what exactly, what type of shift would actually make this cost minimum. So the more you shift to the right, the more the additional cost of putting in flour, more the flowers, more the cost, okay? But the less the chance of underweight packets. Okay, so you make a compromise between these two and try and find the minimum cost so that you can fix your mean at that level. So this is one way of looking at this problem. Okay? So you can use statistics to help this. You can even have, a, as I said, an optimization problem. This is not going to be simple because you'll have a phi involved in your optimization. Okay, and uh, you'll have to do trial and errors and do this. Okay, there is an alternative way of doing this. And uh, can you guess what? Okay, so the other way that you can do this is not by shifting the mean, but by tightening up the process so that the variability becomes less. So what happens if instead of a standard deviation of 16, I have a standard deviation of five? You see, I'm just talking, this is where, you see, Classroom teaching and practice becomes different. I'll talk to you about standard division being 16, 17, 18, but what does it actually mean? Okay, so let's see. So if I decrease it from 16 to 5, then what happens is that now again I have the same problem, but in this case, my standard division is 5, so in, instead of the divisor of 16, I'm using 5, and then the probability comes down to 2.28 percent times. So even with a mean of 1000, if I can tighten up the variance, which really means that the concentration around the mean becomes higher, so the outlying values then below 990 will be less, and therefore there would be less number of prosecutions. The only problem with this is that might be a heard of this in your SQC classes, is that tightening the variability is very difficult at times. This is primarily because, you see, you have to be more efficient. You have to be more careful in filling up the packets. If you are more careful, if you take more time to fill them up, then probably you'll be more accurate. But that will take you more time. So instead of maybe 100 packets every day, you'll be producing only 70 packets because packaging takes more of a time now. Okay, So that way you make a loss. So there are, in most cases, 
tightening up a process is much more difficult than controlling the mean. Not controlling the variance is always difficult because it means that you have to increase the efficiency of the process itself. Okay? So if you can do it, it's fine. In fact, if you can tighten up the process, you, you know this, okay. What happens if I tighten it up so well that I make the standard deviation zero? And then it all all the packets will have 1000 but i can't do that that's a, that's where the problem comes in okay so this is another alternative that you can explore so this is basically the problem that i wanted to talk to you about and you can see that it's simple it's a even for a simple case of 1000 weights of uh, 1000 grams of flour packets you have a statistical problem that you can use okay just to help the prosecutor, uh, the producer in this case. And in fact, uh, the next part of the problem will tell you also how you can help the law, in fact. Okay. So in many countries, the law is somewhat different. What they do is they put it this way. If a packet is 1% underweight, as we were looking at, they say that you check 12 other packets. Okay. It's, it's sort of... Uh, double sampling, uh, dub, uh, what do you call it? Uh, sampling plans. Okay, you have you have two state sampling plans, and it's something like that. Okay, so if a packet is one percent underweight, you check twelve other packets, and if the mean of this twelve is 0.4 percent underweight, then you prosecute. So you don't prosecute just because one packet is underweight. You look at twelve other packets, and now it's much more tightened. It's not 1%, but only 0.4% underweight overall, then you prosecute. Okay? And what is the probability of this? If I am assuming XI is norm as before, it's normal 1016 square. Then you look at Y is summation XI by 12. And in that case, Probability of X, this is already done. X is less than 990. Probability Y is less than 996 is. Z is, again, the standard normal. And you, you see the variance obviously changes because it becomes sigma square by 12 now. Okay. And uh, this is the standard deviation that came out. It's 4.61. And the phi value came out to be 0.192. So probability of prosecution is that it's less than 990, and then it's less than 990, and hence you check for y to be less than 996. So probability of y less than 996, given it's less than 990. But since the first packet and the other packets are taken separately, so you can assume independence, and you can calculate this figure, and this comes out to be 5.13%. So very often the law goes this way, that you don't just base it on one packet. If it is underweight, okay, you suspect the producer, and then you check 12 other packets. If they turn out to be underweight again, then you prosecute. So they go through a law like this. So there are different types of laws, and this is one way of somewhat safeguarding the prosecution. In fact, you can, I'll, I'll, there are lots of problems that you can think of. You see, when I talked about the first part of the problem, I said 26.6, but not everybody turns up. So maybe 25% turns up. So you can do the same problem here also. 25% turns up, and then you can calculate this. And you can see that this figure would come down very rapidly. OK? So this is one problem that I wanted to talk about. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll take questions later on. But let me go to a more complex problem. Uh, how much time do I have? Okay. So let me go from a packet of flour to a packet of biscuits. And uh, okay. So again, it's very often made for flour and many other things, maybe. Okay. So I'll be looking at a different packet now. So suppose a biscuit weighs about 10 grams. And I have a packet that has 25 biscuits. So the total net weight of the packet is 250 grams. And you'll see that at the back of the packet, it's always written that the net weight is 250, 300. It depends on what the weight of the packet is. And the price would also depend on what the weight is. 
But the question now here is, what do you look at? Do we look at the total weight of the packet or do we look at weight of individual biscuits? So what is our item in this case? Previously it was just flour, so we didn't have a problem. But in this case, we have a packet which contains individual biscuits. So I, we can either look at biscuits singly or the biscuits on the whole, that is the packet as such. Okay. So what weight exactly would we be looking at? Suppose I'll, I'll just put the law in this here. I change this a, a little bit from 1% to 3% for calculations, etc. for you to understand this better. So suppose an item cannot be more than 3% under weight, okay? The question is, what is an item? If it is a packet, then the packet should not weigh less than 242.5 grams. That is 7.5 and then you have, this is under weight. If it is single biscuit, then the biscuit should not weigh less than 9.7 grams. So exactly what am I going to look at? Let's look at them one by one. Okay, look at the weights of the biscuit. So let X be the weight of a biscuit. Assume X is normal 10.8 square. Now you don't ask me why I'm assuming this, I'm just assuming this, okay? If you have reasons to disbelieve this, what would you do? You do exactly what I did before. For the flower case, you take a sample. Try out the mean, try out the variance, do some testing or estimation, and get these figures. Okay, but that's that's something I'm not going to talk about here. This is uh, I'm talking about something quite different here. So I'll be assuming this to be 10 and 0.8. So just bear with me. The mean is 10 because, as I said, the very biscuits are about 10 grams, and 0.8 is the standard deviation. And X is less than 9.7 would really mean that 35.38% chance of prosecution because 35.38% of the biscuits would be underweight. And that's a huge, huge figure, right? 35 is close to almost it's one third of the packets are going to be, or one third of the biscuits are going to be underweight and you are, have a chance of a very high chance of prosecution in this case. Now, if all the biscuits are underweight, then the packet is underweight. Now, I'll qualify this. So all the biscuits are underweight would be, this is each one of them, each one of the 25 are less than 9.7. And this chance is very small. Okay, and you just, these are independent of each other. So you can just take the product of this. And so 0% chance of prosecution if you go by packets. Okay, I put a question mark of this. You should be happy with this, okay? If so, you'd be saying that, okay, we'd be looking at packets because, but no, th this is a wrong statement that I'm making because the converse is not true. The packet is not underweight because all the biscuits are underweight. Even if some of the biscuits are normal or overweight, the packet can still be underweight. Okay, so this path, this slide is not good enough. Okay, so this is a fallacy. So what exactly do you do? Look at the weight of the packet. Oh, so let u be the weight of the packet. And u is x1 plus x2 plus x25, where xi is a normal with mean 10 and variance 0.8 square. So then u is normal with mean 250 and variance of 4 square. Okay. This comes out from standard calculations. And the probability of a packet being underweight would be probability of U is less than 242.5. And by the same method, you can get this to be about 3.04%. So you can see that if I look at the packets, it's a less chance of being underweight because some of the individually some of the biscuits may be underweight but on the average this cancels out one negates the other etc and not so many packets would be underweight so we it's generally better to go by the packets as far as the producer is concerned rather than by the 
individual biscuits themselves. Okay. Now the problem here is the packet may be underweight. Again, uh, just be before I come to this slide, just if I look at packets, okay, I'm not going to the details again, and uh, all, all the laws that I've been talking about the packet of flour would also translate to the to this biscuit problem. Either you look at individual biscuits or you look at the packets of biscuits, everything would translate again. You can shift the means, shift the bit, or tighten the variance, or you can actually have a two-step procedure like look at one single biscuit and then an average of a number of biscuits. All those laws that all the methods that I've been talking about would translate to this. But uh, I'll leave it to you to do that because you know now how to actually tackle them. So instead of a jar of packet, you are now looking at a biscuit packet and you're just going to do the same thing. Okay? The other problem that I'd be talking about now in the remaining time is that the packet may be because it does not have 25 biscuits, although it's each biscuit itself may not be underweight. So some packaging error and you're left with the number instead of packaging 25 biscuits somebody has actually not put in all the 25 biscuits and hence the packet is less in weight so if, even if the producer is producing biscuits which are of the right order that is 10 grams the packet might weigh less because there are not they don't have 25 biscuits in them now if the packet has one missing biscuit Let's see what happens. So now u star is x1 plus x2 to x24, not 25. And therefore, the mean is 240. And obviously, the variance would change. It comes to 3.92 square. And the packet weighs less than 245. 242.5 grams is now much more. It's 73.8%. Obviously, you can now see that the if the mean has gone down below the cutoff value of for prosecution. So 242.5 below that if you will be prosecuted. Now the mean is two, less than 242. It's only 240. It still can have some packets which will which will pass out because even the 240 mean you can have some packets which whose weights are more than 242.5. So it's but then that's only about 24-25%. So the most of them, 73 point, almost 74 percent of them are going to be underweight. Okay? So you have a very high chance of prosecution if you have an underweight packet, just because there is a missing value. In fact, in this case, I'm assuming that not all the biscuits are underweight. Now, let's look at the problem slightly differently. So this is just that you have, suppose there are 25 slots like this, and into each one biscuit goes into each of these 25 slots. And suppose the probability that a biscuit goes in one of the slots is 0.99. There are There is very little risk in this. So usually this probability will be very high. Probability of missing out sometimes inadvertently. But that would be very low. So I'm keeping it to be 0 0.01. Again, these are figures I've been assuming. As I said, you can always, when you actually do this, you'll be doing this based on data and finding out what is the probability of this or estimate of this. Okay. Now, if two or more biscuits are missing, then the weight of a packet will be around 230 grams. But if you have a packet which is very light after production, as soon as the when you are putting it in a big carton or something like that, when you pick this packet up, you know that it's very light. So you'll know that it's underweight for some reason. There are less biscuits, etc. So you producer will know that there are missing biscuits. So what will he do is he will I take back the packet and fill them properly. So usually there will be either one missing biscuit or no missing biscuit. If there are more than one bis missing biscuit, that is two or more, the packet will be very light, and the producer will go back and refill this, and the packet will be again having all the 25 biscuits and the and the weight would come up okay so it's either no missing biscuits or one single missing biscuit in the packet now if we assume that uh, 
why is the number of biscuits in a packet and then why would be we'll assume it will be binomial because we are filling them independently of each other so there are 25 slots and the probability of going into one slot is 0.99 so we have a binomial distribution and probability of one missing is y is 24 and you know how to do this it comes out to be 19.47 so probability of no missing is either y is 25, that is all 25 are there, or y is less than or equal to 23, that is two or more missing, in which case the producer is going to go back and refill this. So probability of no missing would be, in fact, you don't really have to calculate it. You can just take it as one minus 0.1947, and that comes out to be 0.8053. So one missing is 0.19 and no missing would be 0 0.80 approximately. So what is the probability that a packet has weight less than 240 grams? I'm sorry, this should have been less than 242.5 grams. Okay, what is the probability that a packet has weight less than 242.5 grams? So weight less than 242.5 grams can happen two ways. One is the weight is less than 242.5 grams and y is not equal to 24. That is no missing. Okay, you have the full packet and still it weighs 242.5 grams less than that. And into the probability that it has no missing value plus it has a missing biscuit and it weighs less than 242.5 grams. So you see the values come out to be, you remember, Probability of y not equal to 24 is 0 0.8053, and probability of y equal to 24 is 0 0.1947. So those are the two values. Weight less than 242.5 grams, given y is not equal to 24, that is no missing, is the first problem. That is, if you have 25, if you have a full packet, and what is the probability of it being underweight? That was came out to be 30, about 3%, so it's 0 0.03. In the second case, you have just a packet, which is 24 biscuits. And for this, the probability came out to be 73% of them were going to be underweight. So it's 0 0.73, 0 0.80. And therefore, the probability that the weight is less than 242.5 grams comes up to be 0 0.1682. So 16.82 times you are going to be prosecuted, either because the packet is overall underweight, you still have 25 biscuits, but it's underweight, or because it's underweight because there is a missing biscuit in the packet. Okay. So that goes up a little bit. OK, so let me come to this last. Okay. So what is the chance of filing a case? Just think of what you would be doing. You buy a packet which weighs less than 242.5 grams. You don't mind if some of the biscuits are underweight. So you wouldn't even notice probably. Nobody notices biscuits, weight of biscuits when they're eating it, right? You just do it involuntarily. So probably if the weight of the biscuits are a little underweight, you wouldn't really notice it. But you'll be annoyed if you find that, OK, the packet should have a 25 biscuits. One slot is empty, so maybe he's cheating on me. OK, there are only 24 biscuits. So what is the probability of successfully prosecuting the producer? So you prosecute him because it's because if there is a missing biscuit, it's likely to be going below 242.5. So you now weigh this. You find that it's less than 242.5. So what is the probability that y is less equal to 24 and the weight is less than 240? So because it's underweight and you have y equal to 24 here. And that, and you know how to do, because you are now using what is referred to as Bayes' theorem. So in this case, you are looking at the weight is less than 242.5 grams, you're weighted, and you find that there are less than 25 biscuits. So that's the probability that you go. So you can do Bayes theorem on this and find out what is the probability of your successfully prosecuting the producer. Okay. So I think um, that's all I have to talk on. Um, before I ask for questions,
you can see that uh, both the problems see in fact i have been talking of similar problem but i have not been dealing with the same thing everything that de i dealt with for the flower problem you can translate it to here you can look at the laws you can look at how you can actually tighten up the process either of the biscuits or of the whole packet as such and then minimize the probability or the minimize the probability of prosecution etc so everything that i talked about in detail for the flower case would work here as well okay so i'd like you to identify the problems and solve them okay so there are lots and lots of problems so you can think on the basis of this in fact it, it can be more of a problem if you go to more complex items where the probability of failures would be depending on a, on a instead of one or two things on several other things and hence there will be laws either for individually for each of the items or for the item as a whole and you can look at these laws or the ways how these laws are formulated how statistically you can solve it should i shift the mean should i tighten up the variance should i increase the surveillance etc efficiency etc so there is a huge lot of problems that you can see so it's when you buy this one packet of flour you don't even notice but there are a lot of problems and a lot of statistical methods that you can use to solve this problem in fact as i said you can use this pro statistical methods to help formulate the law as i said that one percent less does not always mean on a single item doesn't mean anything so you go back and look at 12 or 13 extra packets and then decide on this so you can help to formulate the laws as well so statistics comes in a very big way even in such a very simple problem okay that's all uh, thank you so much sir for this wonderful talk now I would like to request Mr. Shomudip Das to convey the questions to our respected speaker. Thank you, SSS sir, for uh, delivering such an interesting lecture, uh, specifically on the statistical quality control and the related ethics in it. And uh, this, is, this is my duty to uh, put some questions. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. First of all, in order to decrease the variability, you'd have to tighten the process. So wouldn't that mean that my production cost would go high to achieve more accuracy? Yes, obviously. As I said that when you tighten the process, one way that you can do is, you see, I showed you the second slide. It had a picture of people actually making flour and then putting them in packets. Now, if you put the packets very carefully, then there is a greater chance of being more accurate. I'll, I'll give you an example. Most of you have, okay, you have passed out very recently. You have your chemistry classes. You have done titration, for instance, okay. Okay, this is from my personal experience. When I did titration, if I was not careful, I always used to mess it and mix up the whole thing. Okay, so if you are more careful when doing the titration, you'd be more accurate generally. But you, when you are more careful, you take more time on it. And time costs money. Okay, so instead of maybe making 100 packets, we'll be making 70 packets a day. So that is one problem that whenever you try to tighten up, either you have to make the machines better or you'll have to put in more time, etc. And therefore, the production cost would definitely go up. So the cost factor would be uh, and that also you have to be training the persons who are doing this. So everything actually involves a lot of cost in that case. Yes. There's another question. Uh, please repeat probability of no missing case and probability of less than 242.5 gram that case the calculations uh probability of no missing would be that you have 25 biscuits in the packet and still the packet weights less than 242.5 
Yes, that's possible. That's what I showed you very, at the very beginning. Okay, so I have a packet of 25 biscuits and the average should have been 250 and there's always a chance that it's going to be less than 242.5. Okay, that's one part of it. The other part of it is that I have a packet which doesn't have 25, which only has 24 biscuits in it. And the weight definitely is again below 2.5. Okay. The problem in this case is that you see, it's your and our psychology. If we have some biscuits which are a little underweight, making the packet underweight, making the packet less than 242.5, then probably we wouldn't notice it. But if you have a packet which doesn't have the number of biscuits it's supposed to have, you'll be noticing this. Even if the packet is overweight, it might be even overweight, it might be having a weight of, okay, 250 even, okay, with a missing biscuit, because all the biscuits are overweight. So we'll be noticing that, uh, we'll be noticing that much more. So these two would be different distinct cases. Okay. Okay, so there is a third question. The chance of prosecution be reduced if the range of weights in the package be reduced. Range of weights of the package would really mean that you are tightening up the process again. So range basically is another measure of variability. So it's the same thing as saying that standard deviation or range, it would mean the same thing. If you're tightening up the process, the range automatically would fall would become smaller and hence and also the standard deviation would so either you look at the range or the standard deviation and i think you've done this in your sqc classes so you either look at the r chart or the or the s chart etc so it's either one of the two yes you can use any one of the two methods okay that's all uh, both, we have both. Said, question. okay then yes and, Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. Okay. Hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Now I would yes, like to request yes, Dr. Kiran Mai Chatterjee to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Sinjini. Good afternoon to all. On behalf of the organizing committee for this webinar and Department of Statistics, Vidhanagar College. I would like to convey our sincere gratitude to our respected speaker, Professor Suwato Senroy, even from University of Calcutta, for his wonderful talk based on real life examples. I'm sure that all the students as well as our other participants have got the opportunity to strengthen their understanding of basic probability and statistics and their real life applications through his valuable lectures. Thank you, sir. I would also like to thank our principal, madam, uh, Dr. Mudumita Manna, for his constant and encouraging support to conduct the webinar. And after that, I would like to thank, special, to give special thank to some of our undergraduate students, uh, like Somo and Sogoto from fifth sem semester and Arnov and Sinjini from third semester uh, for their commendable help to organize this webinar. And I also like to thank to all of our students and teachers and other participants who uh, joined this program and ha have heard this lecture through Google Meet and YouTube platform. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Email it. Yeah.